Let's talk about our new book, Philippians. I'm sure many of you seasoned ladies have studied the book of Philippians. It's a short one, but man, is it good. Ooh, it is such a good book. There are so many promises. It follows right after the book of Ephesians in, these, in the Bible, and it was written right about the same time as the book of Ephesians. It is one of Paul's prison epistles. Epistle is a fancy word for letters. It's one of the letters that Paul wrote while he was in Rome waiting on trial to be seen by Caesar. When we went through the book of Acts a couple years ago, we talked about this, how Paul had appealed to Caesar and then he had to go as a Roman citizen. And what he was arrested for was for basically making the Jews really mad. They claimed that he brought someone into the temple that was a Gentile, that he was trying to throw out all the Jewish tradition. At least that's what they kept telling uh, everybody that that's what he was doing, when really all he was doing was sharing Jesus, the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the Jewish tradition. But those Jews, they didn't like it. So they trumped up some charges and threw him in prison, and then they tried to kill him while he was in, while he was being held. And they kept trying to bribe the officials to let, let them kill Paul. And so finally he had to say, enough of this bogusness, just take me to Caesar. He's the one who can make a ruling on what's going on. Well, the problem with that was, once you get to Rome, Caesar doesn't have an appointment book, right? Caesar will see you when he darn well feels like it. And so now Paul is stuck in Rome under house arrest, chained to a guard probably at least at night, every single day with no end in sight until the emperor feels like seeing him. So uh, history tells us that Paul was probably in Rome under this house arrest for two years waiting for an appointment. Do you know how frustrating it is right now to make an appointment with any sort of doctor? Especially a specialist. Hello, I'm having heart palpitations. Great, we'll see you in March. <laughs> I'm not going to be alive in March. Like what? I mean, it, uh, back in the day, you'd call the doctor and they'd come to your house and come and see you that afternoon. And you'd give him tea and cookies, at least in the books I read, right? The little country doctor right on their little carriage. And then they fall in love with the patient. Anyway, um, Christian romance. It gets a little dry sometimes, but... In any case, I can't imagine waiting for a two-year appointment. But Paul did. That's where he's at. And one of the things he did while in this waiting period, oh, you know it was orchestrated by God, because he wrote these letters. Instead of just going to visit these people in Ephesus and in Philippi, he wrote them these letters of encouragement. And because of that break, we have these letters today. And I know God has a plan. He does. We're going to talk about that too tonight. But this is one of the, the letters that Paul wrote while he was in jail. You have to have that in your mind. Because when you read the joy that comes off the pages of Philippians, it's easy to think that Paul is in a lounge chair on the Sea of Galilee and someone just brought him a fruity drink, and he's got the sunset in front of him, and he's just on one of these, oh my gosh, God is so good, and God is so amazing, and whatever. No, instead he's under house arrest with no end in sight, chained to a guard, not able to leave on his own free will. And yet the joy is still flowing off the page. Philippians is one of the happiest letters that Paul wrote. It just, it's just encouraging and joyous, and it's one of those, it's a piece of cake, you guys. This book is so sweet. It's eating dessert. Leviticus is the broccoli of the Bible. I will say it every time. And like the middle chapters of Job, when it's not talking about what's going on in heaven, oh my gosh, dry. Okay, it's like trying to eat 15 saltine crackers with no water. It's awful, but not Philippians. Philippians is all sugar and sweetness, and ugh, it's like bread. Carby, fluffy, slathered with butter, bread. 
you guys are like, why do you keep talking about food? I'm sorry, it's all that's on my mind anymore. It's food since the holidays, and I'm like, I gotta cut back, the holidays are over. Nope, bread. It's bread and cake and sweets and amazing, Philippians is. And yet again, I, I'm so encouraged about Paul writing this, even before I even open the book of Philippians. I'm so encouraged about his joy, his encouragement, his love that comes off the page in a season of waiting. I can't say the same for my season of waiting. I'm in this holding period right now. I told you guys back in like, I don't even remember, October, that we were going to be moving to Idaho. And people keep looking at me when I come to church and they're like, you're still here. Are you visiting? Nope. I'm just still here. And I'm grateful. I am. I was so blessed to be able to make it through the Christmas season here. My daughter, Bria, got to finish up her basketball season, you know, and, 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 we, I wanted to be here through all those with our kids' choir. Oh my gosh, the kids' choir was so awesome this year. Um, just so many blessings. And yet, as soon as Christmas was over, I'm like, we're ready. We're go Let's go. Let's go right now. And the Lord's just kept telling us over and over, not yet. I'm like, what are you waiting for? So we've like done everything possible that we could possibly do to get ready for this move. And then it's like God hit pause. So we're waiting for a house. And we keep looking, I'm telling you, I probably check Zillow 450 times a day. Anything new, anything? I even have them email me, right? And every time it's like, new house, oh. Okay, new house, oh. Ooh. Like they have a lot of downtown houses. I mean, to where it's like they were built 150 years ago and they're like, a cookie box? And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't want a cookie box, but it's all me, right? It's me and my wants, and I want this and I want that. Anyway, we're still waiting. I don't love waiting. And I get weary. I get weary of waiting. I get anxious. I get antsy, antsy in my pantsy. It's like, okay, let's go for a walk, right? And um, I want to, the hardest thing is I want to just start taking matters into my hand. I want to start taking control. I want to start looking for jobs for my husband and filling out applications for him. And, um, okay, well, what if I, if I got this house that I don't like at all that doesn't meet any of our needs, how could I change that into the house that I want to, right? And I'm trying to, like, put it all on me of all this stuff. And that's not what the Lord wants me to do. I think of Paul, and I sat there daydreaming me for a while of thinking, what would Paul be doing in his day in and day out? I'm sure he had moments of frustration. I'm sure there were days where he was just sick of being in house arrest and just had a bad day because he's a human being. And two years, yeah, he probably had a lot of bad days and a lot of long days. But one of the things I know he was doing is he spent time praying for these churches that he had planted, for these people that he had known, for the, the, the needs that came to his attention as people came to Rome and visited him and told him about the things going on in the churches. I know he spent time in prayer. We can see it in his letters. I know he spent time writing these letters to encourage other Christians. We're also going to read in the book of Philippians how he spent time sharing the gospel with those guards he was chained to. At one point, he says, every single person in Caesar's household has heard the gospel now in those two years that he's been there. He'd share with whoever the Lord had around him day in and day out, even though he was no longer the missionary on the go, in the, uh, traveling around the whole continent as he went. He was still sharing Jesus. He was using the time in between, the waiting time, living for the Lord. And I'm like, Lord, what am I doing with my in-between days? Am I making them matter? And not with some big gigantic project, not trying to make a mountain or a valley or whatever I'm doing, but just in my day-to-day, -day, am I doing everything set in front of me as if I was doing it for the Lord? Laundry still. <laughs> Uh, cooking still, trying to clean my mom's house every once in a while from all our junk that just collects everywhere. 
What about loving my children? There are so many moments right now with a little extra time that I have. Am I using it with them? Pouring into their lives? You'll notice my fingernails are painted. Alora painted my I never paint my fingernails. I hate having my fingernails painted. But Alora one day is like, Mom, can I paint your nails? And I was like, yes. And her face just beamed, letting my kids have some of this extra time that I now have, right? Purposely laying it aside to love on them, to love my husband. Man, having him not working and being at home all the time, I feel for you retired wives. Like, I get it sometimes where I'm like, dude, like, do you got a project or something? Like, go help my dad with something, right? But there's little moments where I'm like, this is a lot of time spent together, like, in my parents' house. I mean, it's, it can get awkward, but am I spending that time investing it in him? investing it in my parents, investing it in my grandma who's sitting there who I don't necessarily have that many more days with. I can be Jesus now where I'm at while I'm waiting for this next thing to come. Ladies, don't ever let Satan put your life on pause and make you think, well, when that happens this summer, when there are how many months now until summer? Don't let those months just slip by with nothing coming out of it. If it means spending an extra hour in prayer or an extra hour helping out with somebody with something. You know, I realize I don't have my own kitchen right now, but I have plenty of time and my mom's kitchen is the bomb. Why aren't I still making meals for my friends like I would have if I was back home? I've got some hurting family right now, some hurting friends that are going through some stuff that could use that extra bit of my, of my time and attention, right? Instead of pining and scheming about my new house, I can be praying and encouraging others while I'm still here. I'm so grateful I still get to be a part of Bible study because it is a chance for me to still study the word and to share with you guys and it's an outlet for me. Find an outlet for you, for your love of the Lord to come through. Philippians, again, is a book filled with joy in the midst of unhappy circumstances. And I was thinking to myself, joy can be pretty contagious. It's pretty hard to be around someone who, when they're celebrating and they're very much just overflowing with happiness about something, for you to be a sourpuss, unless you're jealous. Now, if you're jealous, you can be very unhappy while they're happy. But most of the time, someone comes in and they're sharing their good news, like you just get built up a little. That joy can rub off on you. And Paul's joy rubs off on the Philippians and the Philippians in turn rub off back on him and they send him all these like gifts and, and um, things to try to encourage him while he's in prison because they, they knew he was imprisoned. They felt awful. They wanted to do something for him. So they would send notes and they'd send gifts and they'd send encouragement. And then Paul would be so lifted up that he sent them back a note full of love and encouragement. And it just builds. It builds. And I love seeing that here. Philippians really is one glorified thank you note where Paul's like, oh my gosh, you guys bless me so much. Thank you. And now here, I want to bless you back. It's a good thing. Maybe you and I need to fix our attitudes to fix the attitudes of those around us too, right? Is your whole office miserable? Are you adding to that? Or are you kind of the one bright spot trying to pull people up with you, with your joy and with your, because you can. You, and especially if you're going through a hard time, especially if your life just stinks right now and you're the bright spot in the office, do you know how much brighter that light's gonna shine? When people say, oh man, well, she doesn't know any of the problems and someone goes, oh no, did you hear? She has this and this going on and her house burned down this summer and whatever, whatever. And they're like, oh, well, how is she so happy? It's Jesus, right? I mean, it's such an easy way to share by just being the joy that Jesus gives us. And there's always a reason to find joy. Always. I don't care how awful your life is. You can find joy in it if you're looking. And that joy is found in Jesus. And I'm going to prove it to you. So 
instead of opening your Bibles to Philippians, open your Bibles to the book of Acts. We're going to go to Acts when Paul first went to Philippi, when he first met the Philippians. It's Acts chapter 16, and it's one of my favorite stories. It's one of my favorite stories from the book of Acts. So let me set the stage while you're turning there. Acts 16. Paul is on his second missionary journey. He's going around new places and sharing Jesus, that Messiah had come, both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. It's amazing what he's doing. He's spreading the gospel all over. But he gets stuck. On this missionary journey, he's been visiting towns again that he went to the first time to re-encourage people. And then he starts going to new places. And they get to this one city, and every door closes. They try to go north, and the Lord shuts the door. They can't go. They try to go south. The Lord shuts the door. They can't go. They've already been east, and they hadn't considered going west. They were just stuck. Until one night, Paul has a vision. And he has a vision of this man saying, Please come over to Macedonia, to Europe. Come over here we need you. We need to hear about the Lord. And so Paul and the guys pray about it, and they say, all right, let's try. Let's try to see if this door is open. I think this is God calling us west, which there was a part of the sea. It's not a whole ocean they had to cross, but the way Europe is laid out, they had to cross a good chunk of sea to get to this other part of land. Otherwise, they had to travel all the way up and around. So they took the shortcut and went over the sea to get to this land, and they stepped foot in Europe. And the first city they go to is Philippi, the Philippians, Philippi. So they land in Philippi. Well, Paul, usually what he would do is go to the synagogue first. He'd go find all the Jews because they already knew about God. They already knew about the Messiah. So he went to go tell them, guess what, guys? Messiah is here. He came. He was in Jerusalem. Let me tell you about him. That was his first thing. And then once he had shared with the Jews, then he'd go share with the people who had zero idea who Jesus was. Unchurched people, you and I, pagans, right? Who grew up without a clue. He'd come and share it with them then next. Well, when he went in Philippi to look for a synagogue to find the Jews, there wasn't one. There weren't enough Jews in Philippi to make a church. So he did what he would normally do. He went down by the river because if you didn't have a synagogue, if there were enough Jews in a the town, they'd get together down by the river. So he went down there to look. Is there anyone here who wants to hear about Jesus? And there happened to be a big old group of women. And the women were down there by the, by the sea, like 10 of them or something. And they were worshiping God down by the riverside. So Paul shared the gospel with them. One of the ladies was named Lydia. She embraced this message of the gospel. She brought Paul and Silas and his crew to her home and took care of them. And her whole house got saved. And it was awesome. The joy started in Lydia's house. We've done studies before on Lydia. I don't want to get too far into it. My favorite part comes next. So there's joy. Salvation has come. The guys were probably all like, confirmed. We were supposed to come here. We were supposed to share the gospel. This whole family right here has gotten saved. Let's go out to the marketplace and start sharing the gospel. So they do. But trouble comes. Dun, dun, dun. Right? We pick up in verse 16. So here's where we go. Okay? Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a, pos I'm sorry, possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. It was snarky the way she'd say it, okay? It's not like she's like, they're like, oh, hey, free publicity. This girl was a pain in the neck, screaming this demon-possessed girl everywhere they went, right? Verse 18, and she did this for many days. Now, you and I probably on day three would have had enough. Paul was a pretty patient guy. He had put up with a lot. It was many days before he did anything about it. 
verse 18 again. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, <laughs> turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now, I wonder when reading this, why didn't Paul do that on day one? I mean, it's a demon-possessed girl. They recognized it as a spirit. Or maybe it took them a couple days. Every once in a while, we come up with a situation that we think is just weird. But maybe after a few days, we realize there's something spiritual about this right now. This isn't a normal thing. May the Lord keep us attuned to that, right? Well, somehow Paul's attuned and he realizes, okay, this is a spirit. Get out of her. Leave us alone, right? Verse 19, but when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe then the multitudes rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods and when they had laid many stripes on them they threw them into prison commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into the stocks. Pause there for a second. Trouble. Right here in River City, right? Trouble. They were arrested. They were beaten. They were thrown not only just into the out outer jail. Now, think of any sort of medieval jail you've ever seen, right? Not a pretty place. But at least some of those cells had windows, right? They had the little bars at the very top where they could peek out. Not in the inner prison. It was, they didn't have electricity. It was dark. It was dank. It never got cleaned ever in the inner prison. And not only were they thrown into these inner cells, they were put into stocks, irons. They couldn't move. I, I was wondering, would they be thinking, how could God let this happen? We were on our way to prayer. We've been sharing the gospel. God, I thought you wanted me here in Philippi. Didn't you call us over here? What is going on? We were serving you, weren't we? How could you abandon us like this? Doesn't he care? Maybe you are asking God the same thing right now. Maybe something's come up and you're thinking, God, how could you? How could you allow this in my life? Maybe it was an eviction notice. Maybe it was cancer, a lost job. Your marriage took a nosedive. You have a child in trouble. Maybe you're still living with your parents because you can't find the right house, right? My troubles seem minimal. But I will share this with you. My mom told me that I could. Uh, a, she has been dealing for the last few months with these little annoying cancer spots uh, on her face. So she's had to have some procedures where they do this blue light thing and they burn your skin and they're taking off all these surface layer things. Well, the last time she went in, they said, hmm, there's two more spots on here that we don't really like, so we're going to biopsy them. Well, my mom has had cancer spots before, that were precancerous and whatever that she's had to have removed. And so she thought it was gonna be the same thing. Well, a couple days ago, she got the call that they're not. They are actual cancer spots. And they're not the super, super bad kind, the melanoma, they're like a very common kind, but they are cancer. And so now she has to go in for some more procedures where they have to take out all the layers and make sure they get clear margins and all that. She was not expecting that call. And when she got that call, it was a bit of a downer day. Because if you've ever gotten that call that you weren't expecting, and now it's going to be all this more stuff that you have to do, it can be a bit of a downer day. She wasn't expecting to start the new year with having to go in for cancer treatments. Mark's cousin who lives in town also got another call early this, uh, this month. As the new year dawns and you think, yay, new year, new possibilities. 
where she now, she's had breast cancer and she had a return with bone cancer. And they let her know this last month that she's probably gonna be on chemo for the rest of her life because of the type of cancer that it is. It's not, it's no longer curable, it's treatable. She, she, they didn't say, you know, you only have so long, but they did say, you'll probably have to do this forever because it spread this one time. And that's not the news you wanna hear, that it's not gonna get better, that it can, it can be okay, but it's not gonna go away. And I think when you get those calls and when you get those questions, you think, Lord, where are you? You know, I thought I was serving you. I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. How could you let this happen? I thought things were good. And the truth is, you guys, that yes, the Lord cares. He knows and he cares so much more than you could even think. It can be hard in the valleys or to, to see the Lord. And it can be hard on the regular days to feel the Lord's nearness. Maybe you haven't felt him for a long time. But I want to share a lesson that Paul learned many times over, and he shows it in this prison, that God is not done yet. This isn't the end of the road. He has plans, and he has purposes for you, for your good, for your continued good. And it's not that surfacy, happy, feely good. It's that deep, lasting, changing good that only he can bring. He's right there with you in the midst, moving and working and setting things up. And maybe it's not even for your best benefit, but it's for the best benefit of someone near you that he wants to save forever. Let's read right here in verse 25 what happens. But at midnight in this inner, stinky, smelly prison, after being beaten and naked in front of the whole town, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. These prisoners had zero chance of hearing about Jesus in the marketplace because they were imprisoned. And the Lord Jesus wanted to reach them. So you know what he did? He let Paul and Silas go to jail so that they would be stuck in the same place where these men were. These men that God wanted to reach. Did you know that Jesus loves cancer doctors? And did you know that sometimes he gives his precious sheep cancer so that they have to go to the cancer doctor office and share Jesus with them and bring that light into the waiting room? Did you know that Jesus loves tow truck drivers? And so sometimes he will pop your tire in the middle of a busy day on a busy street so that you can bring Jesus close to where this tow truck driver is. He also loves police officers and court clerks and shady panhandlers and IRS agents. <laughs> and he loves overworked waitresses and chefs who have 7,000 orders in front of them because they're the only one who showed up to work that day. And he brought you into that circumstance for your awkwardness and your you know, busyness and all the upset that that brings you and uncomfortable pain so that you could bring Jesus near somebody who needed to hear him. And the only way, though, that Paul and Silas were able to share Jesus is because their eyes were on Jesus in that moment and not on their circumstances. Because if you and I had been stripped naked in the marketplace and beaten and thrown into jail, maybe you're better than I am. I think I'd be in there whining and crying and moaning and trying to sleep <laughs> and not up at midnight praying and praising the Lord for what he was doing. <laughs> but because of their praise, because they were looking at Jesus instead of the prison walls, these prisoners had a light in front of them. And it's so beautiful what happens here. How will they hear his name unless we are singing it in their presence? 
Paul didn't give in to fear and whining. Instead, he was singing God's praises. And let's see what happens. Oh my gosh, this story is so great. Verse 26. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that all the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were open and the chains were loosened. Now I can see in an earthquake doors opening, like crumbling, right? The walls fall down, you can just walk right out. But chains loosened? I'm not quite sure how that happens in a prison unless it's this, uh, this earthquake was something from the Lord, right? But this miracle happens and the chains break and the doors open and it's incredible. Paul could have walked right out of there. He could have been like, Lord, you delivered us. Thank you. I am out of the pain. I am out of the dark. I am jumping out of this place. But he didn't. He waited a minute in this uncomfortable situation because I think he had a sense that Jesus was there. And if Jesus is in the dark and in the pain and in the problem, don't you want to stay with him? I want to stay with him. Lord, maybe I want out of this waiting period that I'm in. But if Jesus is in this waiting period, I want to be with him. I don't want to jump out. I don't care how nice the house is. I want to stay where he is. I want to stay close, Lord. He was ready to stay with him. And let's read why. Verse 27. And the keeper of the prison, that jailer who had probably beaten them, probably in charge of all that, right? Awaking from his sleep and seeing that all the prison doors were open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He was the guard. He was responsible. He was going to be held responsible for every single prisoner that escaped. My life's over. Might as well take it now. I might as well die by my own hand rather than shamed and, you know, all this stuff, right? I love 28. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do no harm. We are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's no way Paul had had a minute to tell him about Jesus, but he had been listening. He had been watching. He knew exactly who Paul and Silas were and what they stood for and why they were in that prison. And when he saw that they chose to stay <laughs> and that they cared about him the jailer, it changed his world and he was ready for Jesus. You have no idea how God wants to use you to change the world of someone around you. If only you would keep your eyes on Jesus instead of the circumstances. Mm, I'm so convicted by this because I don't do this every time. I'm up here preaching it, you guys, but it's impacting me too because I don't do this I don't just praise when something bad happens. When my mom's like, hey, so the doctor called and I've got to go in for this procedure next Monday and it's going to take eight hours. And I wasn't like, mom, let's just sing a hymn right now, right? I was like, no, why? Like, bummer. What can we do? What can we? I, I wish my first reaction was to praise and sing, but I know later it is. All right, Lord, just bring those two things closer together as I walk with you more. Make this my reaction, Lord, to praise and to sing. Because I know the Lord can do such good things when our eyes are on him. Such things that we just don't even expect. We don't see it in the valley, but he does. And he knows what he's doing. He knows why. The jailer ends up bringing them back to his house, and he personally washes all their wounds and binds them up and feeds them and houses them, and he and his entire family end up getting saved. Uh, it's such a cool story. Um, verse 34, I'll just read that one to you. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced. Joy. There was joy brought in, having believed in God with his entire household. Families were saved. Enemies were turned into brothers. And joy joy but it didn't start in joy and it wasn't joyous the entire time but that's what god does with those valleys and those trials and those hiccups that come he can turn them into joy if we 
let him. We have responsibility in that, you guys. We can walk around mopey and whining and our eyes on all the bad things that are going on around us, or we can walk around saying, God, you gave me legs to walk around. Lord, thank you for the 50-degree weather where it's not freezing outside, and I can take walks in the sunshine. Lord, thank you for the clouds and the break in the day. Thank you that I have a meal in front of me, even if it's not what I wanted to eat tonight. Thank you that my kids are clothed and whole and we're not suffering from polio. Thank you that we're out of COVID. Thank you that I don't have to wear a mask at the store. You know, I, there, there's so many joys that we could see if we just look, if we just look and take a moment. And if it was true in the jail in Philippi, it was still true for Paul under house arrest in Rome. The jail in Philippi was one night and the Lord did amazing things. Philippi, or in Rome, the wait was two years under house arrest. I, I think the long one would have been harder, right? All of us could feel like, yeah, I could survive one night. If it was one night, I could do it. Two years? Without him knowing that it was going to be two years, it could have been 10. It could have been 15 if the emperor, the emperor made up never even chose to see him. That was up to the emperor. He's the emperor. You can't tell him. Hey, dude, this guy's been in here for a few years. You got to go see him. No one's going to tell the emperor that, right? He'll kill you. But Paul still found joy, and he found being with Jesus in the moment. And again, the truth is that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. That's a verse in Philippians. We're going to read it. Flip over real quick to Philippians. It's actually the only verse in Philippians we're going to read tonight. Tomorrow or next week, we'll actually start reading this amazing letter. But I love it. Most of you guys know this verse. And if you don't, write it on a pillow, put it on a tablet, whatever you got to do, stick it on your fridge, put it on your scale, put it on your coffee mug. Trust me, if you want to buy one with this verse on it, you'll find it at Hobby Lobby. This verse is on everything, right? This is a Christian solid gold verse. Philippians 1.6 being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to work on you and he's going to finish the work until he comes back to get you or until you go to meet him. He will finish the work. If it was true for Paul and for our Philippian brethren, it's true for you too. And this truth gives our life purpose. It gives it meaning that God is doing something and that God will finish it. It gives weight to our pain and purpose to our pain that God is using it to do something awesome. God's not done. Okay, Lord, what are you going to do to make me more like Jesus today? Whatever you desire, wherever you want me to go, yes, I want to be there because that's where you are. Because what you want for us is what we need. What you do with the things we can't even see is amazing. You can use our pain to heal our broken hearts and the broken lives of those around us because you will finish what you've started and I want to see it. I love unfinished furniture. I love a piece that's just been broken and whatever and that needs to be put back together and sanded and stained and painted and pretty and awesome. But in the midst of it, it's pretty ugly. In the midst of the makeover process on furniture, it can look like what in the world is going on there? That's where you and I are. We're in the ugly. We're in the sanding and the chipping and the, and the removing all the stains and all the paint and all the gouges and all those things while still leaving the character. I love the character on a piece of furniture when it still has some touches that make it unique and make it its own thing. But no piece is beyond repair in the master's hands. Just look at his past projects. There are some people who think, well, God has to be done with me because I've messed it up so badly there is no possible way he could bring it back together. I failed. I failed in 2022. I'm failing in 2023. 
I don't read my devotions. I come to church once a year. I just, he doesn't care about me anymore. That's not true. He's still working on you. Look at his children. That's why we have these examples. Abraham was a liar. Moses was a murderer. And so was David. And so was Paul, right? Elijah was suicidal after he saw God do a great victory. Do you have problems mentally where you think about suicide and you think, oh, I can't be a Christian if I think those thoughts? God's kids think those thoughts sometimes. We are human beings with real pain and issues and struggles. Samson was constantly disobedient. His whole testimony is how he didn't listen to God, he didn't listen to God, he didn't listen to God, and yet God loved him and God used him and God chose him. Anyway, Jonah was racist, super racist. And when God told him to do something, he ran the other way. He went through some painful times because of it, but God still used him and God still brought him back and chose him. Peter, I love reading the life of Peter. He was such a bonehead. He really was. He had personally walked with Jesus for three years, the closest that friends could be, the closest a human being could be to Jesus, and he denied him three times and abandoned him in Jesus' worst hour. Maybe you've walked with the Lord for a lot of years, and then you abandoned him. And you think, oh, I could, the Lord could never forgive me. Yes, he can, because he forgave Peter. And he will forgive you, because he's not done with you yet. Maybe you've messed up your entire motherhood, and you've been the worst mother in the history of mothers, and you think, I can never reach my children now. They're 50, and they'll never talk to me, and I can never make things right. Yes, you can, because it's a new day. And with the help of the Lord Jesus, he can heal relationships. I've seen him do it. I've seen him heal marriages that were gone, that were past gone. And the Lord brought them back and fixed them. I've seen suicidal people become missionaries for the Lord that loved Jesus with all their heart and found hope and peace and life. I've seen regular people like you and me live regular lives with regular jobs and regular everydays make a difference for Jesus in one life and in one little way because the Lord's not done with you yet. You're here. He still wants to love you and pour into you and use you and bring you joy. And if Christ, the master craftsman, can bring beauty out of ashes and saints out of sinners and joy out of tragedy, imagine what he can do with you. Imagine what he can do with your unfinished marriage and your unfinished kids and grandkids and your unfinished job and your unfinished dreams and all those things, your unfinished life. I'm excited for a new year. I'm even excited for the bumps and twists and the things that the Lord brings. I know I'm going to be really mad at him when he does. And then he's going to be like, remember your message? <laughs> but I'm a little scared. I'm a little anxious. Lord, what are you going to do? Don't send me to Africa, right? The old song, right? But, but I know Philippians, we, we're here on purpose. We're here on purpose at this point in time because the Lord wants to encourage us and remind us to rejoice to remind us to have joy in him that can never be taken away. No circumstance of the world can take away our joy in Jesus. And remind us that he's working and he's setting things up and he's not done. I'm going to close by reading just a few snippet verses, just so that you know that God doesn't just say this once in scripture. He says it over and over and over and over again. Uh, if we just take the time to look. Psalm 138.8, I like the way it reads in the ESV, so I'm going to read it in that version. It says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. 2 Corinthians 4.17-18, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 
John 13, 7, Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Romans 8, 28 and 29, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In layman's terms, it's your destiny to look like Jesus one day. And he's making that destiny happen. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you need extra encouragement this week, go and read Romans 8 about there being no condemnation, about walking in the Spirit, about being adopted by Him, about being loved by Him, and about how nothing can separate you from the love of God. Read Romans 8. It's, it's just chock full of just verses about how much the Lord loves you and wants to still use you. Or if you have the Bible app on your phone, uh, they do plans and devotions. There's like a bajillion of them on there. If you needed a devotion, just type in plans. They have Billy Graham, they have C.S. Lewis, they have a ton of them on there. And I found one this last week while I was thinking about this theme of God not done. And maybe you guys have heard the song, God's Not Done With You by Torrin Wells. He actually wrote a 10-day devotional called God's Not Done With You. It's incredible. Oh my goodness. I don't really care for him as a songwriter. I mean, as a singer, he's just not really my style. Although when Corinne sang his song for the talent show, it was my favorite. I just have to say, Corinne's beautiful voice. Um, but on the Bible app, God's not done with you. It's a 10-day plan. And wow, it just knocked my socks off. Um, it's super good if you need that extra encouragement because God is not done with you. All right, let me pray for you. Lord, master craftsman, finisher, author, storyteller of our lives, we're so grateful that our lives are not in our hands. Thank you, Father, for holding each one of us in the palm of your hand, and no one can snatch us out of your hand. Jesus, we're so grateful that you know. You know what we're going through. You know where our hearts are our minds, our circumstances, Lord. And Father, you've called us to have joy. And for some of us, that sounds pretty simple and pretty easy, and that's what we want. And for some of us, it sounds impossible. But with you, Lord, all things are possible. I pray tonight, Jesus, Holy Spirit, that every single one of these listeners, every single one of these women, Lord, would walk out of here with a little seed of joy in their hearts, joy because they know Jesus, because Jesus has them and knows them and has plans for them and is working on them and, and still loves them and still wants to use them. Lord, keep that seed watered. Let these women just hear your words and hear your love. Father, let them look beyond their prison walls, beyond their confinement, beyond their trials, Lord, to you. And may them just be singing your praises, Lord. And Father, for those people around us that we can't see, for the jailers and the prisoners, Lord, that ha are not on our radar right now, that you would shine our light, your light through us, Lord, and touch those lives, Lord, and let us be a part of it. Let us be a part of your salvation here in Montrose. Lord, we just, we're so grateful for you. And Lord, we want to be your children. We want to be your light. Help us, dear Jesus. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Only you can do the work. We give it to you again tonight. We give you our year. Lord, we give you our highs and our lows and our in-betweens. Make us more like you, sweet Jesus. We love you with all of our hearts. Be with my mom and these procedures she has next week. Be with um, Mark's cousin, Lord, and the procedures she has coming up. Father, for all the unspoken medical requests that are in this room right now, Lord, Touch them with your spirit. Bring us in front of the people who need to hear you and let us shine your light. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. More Philippians next week. We'll see you then.